Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Proverbs. I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, chapter 27, verse 17. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, the internet connection will be good through the whole show. I, last time, it, uh, I lost the connection after about 20 minutes, so that's why that one was a little short. But... Uh, if you haven't seen the previous episodes on Proverbs, uh, they are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. But uh, let's start right now. Chapter 27, verse 17. I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll look at the KJV first, and then I'll probably look at it also in the Amplified, because sometimes I find that helpful. Verse 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Well, this is a, this is a famous verse, it's a popular verse, and it's kind of like a, like a double-edged sword verse, I think, because um, it really can be used in a very good way. And, and unfortunately, it can also be used in a bad way. It can be abused. Um, some people take this verse to think it's their responsibility to like correct and criticize everybody all the time. And that's their, their ministry is correcting and criticizing. Uh, but if you have a friendly, really true friendship relationship with someone and you have the ability to talk to them and they, uh, a good relationship, uh, you should be able to um, correct each other. Uh, not only correct each other uh, in just in life in general and, and offer guidance and counseling to each other, but uh, particularly in the, in the scriptures and in doctrine. We should be able to, um, you know, discuss, uh, debate theological subjects and scriptures uh, without anybody getting angry. Uh, as long as, as long as the two people agree on the, the core doctrines of Christianity, that is the person of Jesus Christ and the means of salvation, uh, if we have that right, then you should be able to discuss all the other theological subjects with courtesy and respect. Um, unfortunately, I've encountered an awful lot of people, though, that uh, they... They take minor doctrines and elevate them in importance uh, and want to uh, argue over those in a way where they say, if you don't agree, if you don't conform, then we divide over it. So we should, we should definitely take stand our ground and not compromise on the core doctrines of Christianity, but on a thousand other theological subjects and questions, we should, be, should give each other liberty. Uh, we don't have to agree. We should just be able to uh, argue and debate. When I say argue, I don't mean raising our voice and getting angry. I'm talking about arguing as attorneys argue in a courtroom, just trying to um, prove their case. But uh, there's a saying that I like. It says, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Well. I don't, I, I don't mind entering into a, a debate with you on some theological question. Uh, if it's done with respect and courtesy, and if, if we're both willing to listen and consider, consider the other person's opinion, and, and then if I'm, if I'm persuaded and, and, and proven wrong, why would I want to hold on to an error once that's been proven wrong? Oh, it says only a fool would hold on to the errors once they've been proven wrong. So... The only thing you have to lose are the errors you hold. Uh, listen to each other. Be willing to do that. Iron sharpeneth iron. We can make each other better. But don't use this verse as a means of beating up and abusing the brethren. Uh, okay. Uh, let me re see how that's phrased in the uh, Amplified. That ought to be interesting. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another through discussion. Okay. That's pretty much what I was saying, except more concisely. Let's go to verse 18 in the KJV. 
Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Well, I think I'm going to need to look at the Amplified to, before I even try to comment on that. It says, he who tends the fig tree will, will eat its fruit. So if you're the one that's planting and watering and pruning and taking care of the fig tree, you should be able to eat the fruit from the fig tree. And he who faithfully protects and cares for his master will be honored. So in the same way that someone who is faithfully taking care of that fig tree will should benefit by having fruit, enjoying its fruit, the same way uh, uh, he who faithfully protects and cares for his master will be honored. Now, master could be just if you're working in someone's home as their servant, that could be uh, you call them a master. Uh, if you're an employer, an employee-employer relationship, that could be servant and master in, in uh, more of a modern uh, vernacular. But uh, if you faithfully work as an employee, you're being a really good worker, then uh, you should, uh, you'll be honored. You'll be, you'll uh, get, be respected and you'll be compensated. Okay, let me see how that's, uh, I'm going to go to the KJV for the next verse now. And it's uh, verse 19. As in water, face answereth to face. So the heart of man to man. I have no idea what that means. As in water, face to answereth to face. Okay, maybe it's looking in the water and seeing your reflection in the water. Uh, face to face. So the heart of man to man. So your heart is speaking to you. You should be able to look in the water, you see your reflection, and uh, answer yourself according to what you really see. And so the heart, listen to your heart. And uh, let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. Yes. So... Jesus spoke in about the same kind of a thing, uh, uh, whatever, uh, you, you, are, you are what comes, your heart, uh, oh, I forget how it's uh, expressed, uh, uh, it's not what goes into the, the mouth that's um, bad, that, but it's what comes out of the mouth that's bad, you know, because what comes out of your mouth is a reflection of what's in your heart. Let's go to verse 20 in the KJV. It says, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. <laughs> okay. Hell and destruction are never full. Hmm. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. The eyes of man. What happens when we, with our eyes, and being satisfied, it's lust. Lust starts with our eyes, uh, whether it's lusting uh, in a sexual way or whether it's lusting for uh, in a form of envy where you see wealth and you're lusting for their wealth, their success. <clears throat> so these things start with the eyes. Let's see how it's expressed in the Amplified. Um, Sheol, the place of the dead, and Abaddon, the underworld, are never satisfied, nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. Yes, if we, uh, we have to be careful. Uh, we see things and then we want them. All right, let's go on. Uh, the next verse in the KJV, verse 21, as the fining pot for silver, and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. So the fining pot for silver, it refines it and purifies it. The same thing with the furnace, that's what it does to gold. So is a man to his praise. All right, well, 
And we'll see how it's a phrase in the Amplified. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold to separate the impurities of the metal. And each is tested by the praise given to him and his response to it, whether humble or proud. Hmm. Well, obviously we know that the Bible teaches us that humility is a virtue and pride is a sin. Pride is maybe the original sin. Uh, the kind of, it says that the love of money is the root of all evil, but I suspect pride is right up there. Uh, the love of money is just being covetous and envious and, and, and desiring more and never being satisfied as the previous verse was stating. But pride, uh, that's what happened with the, the fall, the, 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 with uh, the fall of uh, Satan. He was prideful. He, he was lusting for power and glory. He wanted what God had. Uh, with Adam and Eve, it was pride, thinking that, well, if we just eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, We'll know what God knows. We can discern for ourselves what's right and wrong. and We won't need God. We can just be independent and make our own decisions. That was based on pride. And pride's a problem today. Most people I encounter, that you say, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? And they, if they say, yeah, it's, oh, it's because of me. It's because I'm good enough. <laughs> they don't realize that. You can't get into heaven no matter how good you are, no matter how hard you try to be good. You'll always fall short. And you'll never be good enough to, to uh, meet the standard that God set, which is perfection. So, uh, and then there's uh, other people that display pride and that when you tell them that uh, heaven is not determined by if you're a good enough person, heaven is determined by your faith in Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Stop trying to achieve it on your own, and their pride won't allow it. Just to trust Jesus and be a humble um, uh, believer in Jesus. Just humbly trust Him to to do what needs that He did what was needed for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He raised from the dead. He has the power to give you life and death. You're going to trust Him. Put your faith in His hands. That's humility. Admitting that you can't do it. Many people are too proud to do that. They think, I don't need Jesus. I can get there on my own. I'll, I can be good enough. So this question of humility versus pride is, uh, humility is definitely, uh, I think it's a prerequisite for salvation. It's something that happens before people get saved. They, they're humble enough to admit they need the Savior. If you, you can't even acknowledge that you need the Savior, uh, that pride prevents you from doing that, then you're not going to be saved because you're not going to see the need for Jesus. Um, verse 22 in the KJV says, Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Well, that's like a riddle figuring that one out. It says, though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle. Well, I, I know what the things are. I know what a mortar and pestle is. I know what, how you grind it uh, up. So it's talking about taking a fool and grinding them up, yet will not his foolish depart from him. So you can take a fool and you can just grind him up and the foolishness still doesn't depart from him. First, let's look at that in the Amplified and see if that's how it explains it. Even though you pound a hardened, arrogant fool who rejects wisdom in a mortar with a pestle like grain, yet his foolishness will not leave him. That's quite a stubborn fool, I'd say. Okay, back to the KJV. 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure 
uh, to every generation. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance for thy maidens. Now, you may have noticed that I read verse 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So there's five verses there strung together. I think they're all connected in the same thought, teaching the same lesson. Sometimes in Proverbs, one verse stands alone. It's a principle to learn just from the single verse. Other times in Proverbs consists of two or three or four or five verses. Let me read that in the Amplified, though. Um, it says, be diligent to know the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the grass is gone, the new growth is seen, and herbs of the mountain are gathered in. The lambs will supply wool for your clothing, and the goats will bring the price of a field, and there will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and for the maintenance of your maids. So it starts off in verse 23 saying, be diligent. That's really what that verse is all about, is diligence. Uh, if, if you are diligent, you're going to get out of life what you need. You're going to probably even attain more than you need, just even all your desires, if you're diligent. <laughs> so in Proverbs, a lot of times it contrasts two ideas or two types of people. Contrast the fool versus the wise person. It contract, contrasts it. And, uh, sometimes a diligent person versus a lazy person. Someone who will, will get out of bed and go to work and still succeed in life. Someone who wants to sleep all day and is too lazy and they make an excuse to say, there's a lion outside. I can't get out of bed and go to work, you know. So this is really all about diligence. Be diligent. You will succeed in life if you're diligent. Um, you see, there was a there's a formula that I used to talk about years ago. Uh, K plus A equals success. Knowledge plus action equals success. If you know what you're doing and then you work at it, you take action, you'll succeed. Uh, that's, that's guaranteed. Learn what to do and then do it. Get busy doing it. Be diligent and you will succeed. Uh, so that's what these verses are about, being diligent. But if I was had to choose between having knowledge or diligence, uh, more important is diligence. Because if you're diligent, if you're getting up and trying every day, even if you don't know what you're doing, guess what? You eventually learn what you're doing through making mistakes and trial and error. It's a hard way to learn through trial and error and through your mistakes. It's wiser to learn from other people. The Proverbs tells us we should, a wise man has many counselors. If you have a counselor, you can ask them and perhaps you can learn from the mistakes they've made and you don't have to repeat their mistakes. And that way you're, you're miles ahead in your, in your progress. But, so the important thing, even more than knowledge, is diligence. Okay, that's the end. That's the end of chapter 27. Let me move on to chapter 28. I'll see how far I can go before before I give up, give out, give, give out tonight. I'm, I'm already tired because I've already done a couple of these hangouts earlier today. Verse 28 in the KJV says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. So these verses here are independent of each other, I think. And let's look at the first one in the Amplified. The wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous are, are as bold as a lion. So a good man will be bold, and, and uh, uh, a wicked man is going to be cowardly. Um, cowardly, uh, 
a lot of people misunderstand what what courage is though i mean i, I used to have people tell me all the time brother look luke you're uh, uh you're you, you you got and you street preach in front of hundreds of strangers and uh yeah that's uh you're, you're so brave to do that you're you, you're so courageous to do that. I could never do that. I have, I'm too afraid. Um, well, guess what? I've always been afraid too. A lot of times I'm, I'm afraid before I make a video or before I'm speaking to a group of people, I'm afraid. But you know what courage really is? Courage is not the, the absence of fear. <laughs> courage is proceeding forward even in the presence of fear. Even though you're afraid, you'll still go forward, even though you're afraid. What I found in all my preaching, though, is that I might be afraid before I get started, but as soon as I open mouth, my mouth, I, I feel like there's there's no fear left. I think that the, the Spirit of God is just strength and takes away the fear once I'm courageous enough to begin. So let me go back to the KJV for the verse 2 of chapter 28 in Proverbs. For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. All right, it's another one of those verses that I'm going to look at the Amplified, see if it'll help me understand it. It says, when a land does wrong, it has many princes. But when the ruler is a man of understanding and knowledge, its stability endures. So when you, if you have a bad ruler of a land, then the land will probably be broken up into many pieces because everybody, all these factions will fight and divide the land. But if you have a, uh, a good leader with knowledge and understanding, everything will be successful and be, will remain unified. Um, that could be applied in so many ways, uh, not only in land, but, uh, you know, even in families and relationships and congregations. Verse, look, let's look at verse 3 in the KJV. A poor man that oppresseth the poor is like a sweeping rain which leaveth no food. Wow. I mean, it's, it's bad enough for a rich man to oppress someone who's poor. But could you imagine someone who is poor and oppresses other poor people? It reminds me of that parable that Jesus told about the man who was forgiven a huge debt. And he went off really happy, relieved. But then he saw a man that owed him just a few pennies and he demanded it. He didn't have it, so he had the man put in prison. I mean, he's, of course, Jesus didn't like that. He said that that man was, uh, I forgot what he said would happen to him, but it wasn't good. And it's the same thing with, if you're poor, you should certainly understand what it's like to be poor. Why would you want to uh, uh, oppress other poor people? You should know better because you're poor yourself. And it's just like the man that, he had this huge debt forgiven. He should understand better than anybody the relief of having someone forgive your debt, but he was unwilling to forgive a small debt from someone else. I'm going to read verse 3 in the Amplified. A poor man who oppresses and exploits the lowly is like a sweeping rain which leaves no food. All right, verse 4 in the KJV says, they that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Um, and in the Amplified, it phrases it, those who set aside the law of God and man praise the wicked, but those who keep the law of God and man struggle with them. Uh, so you're on the side of the wicked if you're a lawbreaker. Uh, if you are a, a person who is um, a law-abiding citizen, then you're on the side of the law. 
and you're, you're, you're part of the struggle against the lawbreakers. Verse 5 in the KJV says, Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. <laughs> well, I wish I could say that is true in my life. I, I've been seeking the Lord. You know, I, I first I seek the Lord. I read the Bible. I learned about who he is. I learned about his love for me. I learned about his death on the cross, demonstrating how much he loved for me, a sinner. He paid for my sins. And I've believed in him. I've been born again. And all these years later, I still can't say that. How is it phrased here? Let me see. E, uh, Yeah, it says, evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Well, I understand about judgment, but I don't understand all things. Let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Evil men do not understand justice, but they who long for and seek the Lord understand it fully. Oh, okay. So... Instead, when it says all things, it's all things pertaining to justice. All right. Well, in that, in that case, I'd say that, that that does apply to me. And it would apply to you, I guess, too, if you, if you understand, you know, how things work. That uh, uh, no one is righteous, not even one person. Uh, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the, the wage of sin is death. So uh, they, they, this is what you get. Because of sin, we die. And the Bible says it is appointed for man once to die. And then the judgment. After we die, we get judged on our life. And uh, if you're judged on your life, what would God say? Would God say, you've been perfect. Come on in. Or will he say, no. Nah, you, you're not perfect. See, that that's what you don't probably don't realize is that you're not judged on a scale like you were in school where, uh, you know, if you just get 60% right, it's a D, at least you passed. And if you get 95% right, it's an A, you're really excellent. No, uh, it's 100%. Per, you have to have a perfect score. You have to be able to go before God and say, I've in my whole life, I did never, never do one thing wrong. I never even had one bad thought. And I never failed to do good every opportunity I, I had. That's what you'd have to be able to say, honestly, for you to be found uh, acceptable. You have to be perfect. And that's why none of us can do it. That's why we all fall short of the glory of God. So what are we going to do? You can be judged based upon your own performance and found that you're lacking. Or you could say, I need help. I'm in a bad situation here. I need help. God help me. Uh, the, the apostles asked Jesus after he was teaching, they said, well, Lord, how is it possible for anyone to be saved based on what he had told them, based on what I just told you? How is it possible for anyone to be saved? No one could be perfect. And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's why it, I'll say again, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can't get through heaven through your own merit, but you can get there because God offers it to you as a gift, a free gift from Jesus Christ. And that's what, uh, Christianity really is. Biblical Christianity says, if you will just put your faith in Christ, he will give you eternal life as a free gift. This is free gift theology, Christianity. But if you, if you don't receive this gift of eternal life from Jesus because of your faith in him, then you're on your own. You'd have to be able to plead to God, I've been perfect, never once have I done anything wrong. So what do you want to do? Do you want to try to get there on your own or do you want to admit defeat and say, I can't do it? 
many years ago, I admitted defeat. I said, it's impossible. I need to be saved. Who's the Savior? The Bible said there's only one Savior. It's God himself. And it says Jesus Christ is the Savior God. We need to trust him, rely on him, depend on him. So 29 years ago, I cried out, Jesus, I'm calling on you. Lord, save me. I'm trusting you. I called on the name of the Lord Jesus. I trusted him. And I'm confident I'm going to go to heaven. Not because I'm a better person than you. You might be a better person than me. But the Bible says it's not because of righteous things we've done. But we're, we're saved because of his mercy. He's merciful. He's gracious to all of those who put their faith in Jesus. Now, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, the Bible says that he came down from heaven and became a man. It says God was manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus said the reason he came down from heaven and became a man was to, to die, to give his life as a ransom for us, to suffer and die on a cross, to pay for our sins, and he did. All my sins are paid for. All your sins are paid for. So you get to go to heaven if you'll trust Jesus. And he was truly dead. He suffered and died on that cross. And they buried him. And on the third day, he was raised back to life bodily. And it was no surprise, really, because he promised he would. The Jews demanded a sign, and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They thought he, he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. And they said, you can't raise the temple in three days. It took 40 years to build it. But he was talking about the temple of his body. He's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He promised that even though he would die and be buried, he'd raise himself back to life as a sign to prove he is God. He is the Savior. He does have the power over life and death. And he will give us life everlasting if we'll trust him. It's a free gift. It's up to you if you want to receive it. You receive it through faith alone, in Christ alone. That completes the study for tonight. Uh, I hope you will join me nightly, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, for more of these Bible studies. Uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.